All right. Hi, everyone. Okay. So, there's something going on in this whole entrepreneurship world, right? Everyone's got a cool website. Uh, there's this internet thing, and it's pretty cool, and it, it works. But I'm interested in talking to you guys about something else, which is using that internet thing and using it to do something the world has been doing for a long time. Uh, something that actually moves the world forward quicker than any website or any thing has ever done, and that is to actually invent, uh, to make real shit. So um, I want to tell you my story. Um, I'll tell you my personal entrepreneurial story. You can sort of glean whatever lessons you want out of that, and then just sort of talk to you very briefly about what it means to make real stuff. So my whole entrepreneurial career started in math class. I was a senior in high school, and I was probably one of the worst students you could possibly imagine. Um, I, I think I had like a 1.8, 1.9 GPA, and uh, I was doing everything I could not to listen to my teacher. Um, and I had just gotten an iPod shuffle, that long, light iPod shuffle. And so I went home, and I prototyped this product idea I had out of ribbon and gift wrap. And uh, it was a lanyard headphone. It was sort of snaked your wires up and uh, let you listen to your iPod pod without your teacher realizing. And uh, I showed it to my parents, and they remortgaged their house, and they sent me to China before my high school graduation, and they said, okay, if this is what you think you want to do, we'll support you. Great parents. So uh, I went to China. I went to China before my high school graduation. I knew a guy who knew a girl who knew a guy who knew a factory. I met that factory. I talked to them about my idea. They did a really shitty job of making the product, but the product got made, and I got on the last possible flight home before my high school graduation, landed at JFK. My parents drove me to graduation, and I graduated somehow. And, um, and I launched my first company that same day. Uh, my first company was named Mophie. Uh, it was named after my two golden retrievers, Molly and Sophie. And um, it was an iPod accessory company, plain and simple. Um, we created great solutions to uh, all sorts of Apple um, hardware uh, sort of nuances. So uh, I brought the product line over to Macworld. It was like the industry trade show uh, in 2006 and actually got best of show. And while I was sort of sitting there at Macworld 2006, I walked into this sort of trade show Moscone Center thing and I realized that every single uh, booth looked the same. Everyone was doing the same thing. They were trying to sell these customers and these retailers and, and everyone on what was new, selling what was new constantly. And even though there were minor differences between all the different product lines, everyone was doing the same thing. So luckily, I got best of show, and, and, and the show went well for Mophie. But when I came back in 2007, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to sort of change the way trade shows are done. Now, a special thing happened before Macworld 2007, and that was I was on a subway car in New York. This is around six months into the launch of Mophie. And I looked to my right, and there was this woman. And I don't know who she was or where she came from or what her deal was, but she was wearing that product. She was wearing the product I designed in high school. Now, the Mophie song sling didn't change the world. It didn't really do anything, um, except let you be a bad student. Um, but that was the most special feeling I could possibly ever sort of discuss. Oh my god, I made that. That came out of my face, and without me, the world would not have that product. And I don't know who she is or how she heard about my item, but she's enjoying it. Best feeling in the world. Now, immediately concurrent with that, I realized that I wasn't unique in the fact that I had a product idea. Everyone in the world has product ideas. Product ideas are just part of daily life. You're looking at the floor, and you see your power strip, and you're saying, oh, well, maybe I can make a better one. But I was unique in the fact that all the circumstances lined up to allow me to execute on my idea. So when I came to Macworld in 2007, I sort of had this theory. Could the Macworld community together develop a better product than I could as sort of a four-person team out of the state of Vermont? So I showed up to Macworld and built a booth out of two-by-fours. It looked something like that. I handed out 30,000 pads uh, to the show attendees and said, we have four days together. Let's design an entire product line. 
So uh, we collected hundreds of product ideas in the first few hours. We then moved over to industrial design, mechanical engineering, naming the product, naming the colors, all as a live sort of experiential project right on the show floor of the Moscone Center. That little project proved that as a company, we sort of changed the, the conversation. It wasn't about selling what was new, it was about asking what was next. And that is a true sort of consumer experience. So we developed a product and it was successful and uh, went on to, to um, grow Mofi. I did, had designed a product called the Mofi Juice Pack, which is, a, is the first iPhone case with a built-in battery pack, and, and then sold the company in August of 2007. Now, I sold the company, this is a good story, little, this is a little aside. Um, I sold the company in August of 2007, not because I was fed up with you know, Mophie as a business, but because I sort of had this grander vision. I wanted to make invention accessible. I wanted to, to make it possible for all people with great ideas to execute on their visions. And I went to Mophie's board of directors, which was predominantly sort of controlled by venture capitalists, and I shared this vision, and they said, boy, we invested in iPod condoms, we want iPod condoms. Um, so they, they just sort of made me stick to this whole iPod, Apple world, and um, my vision was bigger. So we sold Mophie. And uh, on we went to sort of realize that everyone in the world had an opinion. And how could we actually use the internet, use the websites that are out there, to gather all those opinions and make the world move forward, make inventions out of sort of the opinions of the people of the world. So it took us a few years to figure that out. But we, um, we came to a realization, um, a grand realization, and that was for centuries, and I hate when people start sentences with for centuries, because then it does off, I feel like I'm in class. Um, but literally for centuries, inventing new products has been really, really hard. You need to have access to capital, you need to know the right people, you need to be multidisciplinary between design and engineering and manufacturing and retail and merchandising and warehousing and logistics and all these different things need to come together just to push one brand new product out into the world. And frankly, that's not okay. So how can we fix it? Well, um, this is Jake. And Jake's story is one of the first stories Quirky's had to tell about how invention is now accessible. Jake's story is my, my little favorite story right now. And uh, Jake's a kid from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Not necessarily a budding entrepreneurial capital of the world. Now Jake uh, was in high school when NASA, like spaceship NASA, came around to his class and said, invent something. And he did. He actually went home and uh, and he basically looked at its floor, like I mentioned, saw a power strip and said, how come I can't use all the power bricks and how come I can't fit all the power bricks into one power strip? Now, he actually did a little sketch and a thing I'll show you in a second and submitted it back to NASA. He actually won this NASA product design competition. They gave him a $500 check and said, good job, kid, follow your dreams. Um, obviously, Jake couldn't develop a power strip for $500. Um, so he sat on the idea just like most inventors do. He sat on the idea for, I think, four years until he was on an American Airlines flight just over a year ago and read about Quirky in an in-flight magazine. He submitted his idea, which was in this form, trifold board form, uh, to Quirky.com, uh, just clearly outlining the problem, what he understood about the marketplace, and you know, an idea on how the, the problem could be solved. So uh, he took this and went on Quirky.com and Quirky is very simple. The mission of the business, like I said, is to make invention accessible. Every week, about 1,500 people submit their product ideas to Quirky in a very simple format, a very accessible format. What's your problem? What's your intended solution? What are the key features? And what do you understand about the competition? 1,500 product ideas submitted on a weekly basis. There's a global community of hundreds of thousands of people that go in and they vote and they rate and they comment and they enhance and refine each other's ideas until it's Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock. And on Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock, we, the uh, quirky design staff, meet in our model shop, as you see here, and we pick two brand new products, at least two brand new products, that we then move forward into uh, sort of later phases. Luckily for Jake, we, choose what, we chose what he called the usable power strip to be quirky product number 44. We then went on through the progressive phases of research, trying to understand the marketplace in a traditional way. 
industrial design, even something as simple as naming the product, 295 name ideas were, were suggested for Jake's product. In every single one of these phases, the community's voting, they're rating, they're commenting, they're enhancing and refining each other's ideas so that we, as Quirky, make really smart decisions. We probably have one of the more productive common threads on the internet. People aren't just saying that sucks or that doesn't suck. They're saying round that corner, chamfer that edge, or use this color. Now, crowdsourcing is a buzzword that everyone likes to use. And um, I'm fine with it because everyone understands what it means. But in the <laughs> now I'm going to go back on my statement. In the traditional sense of, of what crowdsourcing is, it's all about the fact that the community is smarter than the experts. At Quirky, we don't necessarily believe that. Um, we think that there is a place for both of them. We don't just say Quirky values the community over experts. We say Quirky puts community with experts. We have on staff probably the best product design team in the world. Engineers from product companies like OXO and Smart Design and, and all these guys. And, and they are working side by side with these designers and inventors around the world to make their product a reality. What you're witnessing here was the first print of Jake's power strip. We have an object Conics 350 that we're able to sort of literally print products in real time. That's Jake's product. It became known as the pivot power. That's the pivot power. Now, throughout every stage of product development, we're able to prove that we're making the right decision. So we actually sold a thousand pivot powers before we actually even made one real one. Jake's pivot power then went on to production. It hit its uh, pre-sale threshold very quickly. We did everything that we would need to do in order to protect him. Patents, getting sort of electronic testing lab certification. Uh, and finally, just this past June, we were able to start making the pivot power, making around 2,000 to 3,000 units a day, and we haven't stopped since June 2nd. These are the boxes that Jake's products ship around the world in. Now, these are shippers, which means there's about 40 in a pack. They get immediately thrown away. But one of the things we've found to be very important is putting our inventors' faces on the side of those boxes. Why? Because the FedEx guy that drops it off, well, he can know that his product can now become a reality. The person in the warehouse unpacking the boxes at Bed Bath & Beyond now realizes that, oh my god, I have this great idea. I, I can make the towel rack that we sell much better. And they understand the story. So there's a lot of storytelling going on. That's Jake's product. Jake is probably going to make around $150,000 this year. And it's only been on the market for just a few months. We do a lot to make him a star. Email blasts, 20-foot retail sections at Bed Bath & Beyond, and so on. Now, I spoke a lot about Jake here, but it's not just about Jake. It's about making invention accessible for people all around the world, not just for inventors, but people that like to support those inventors. We have this process we call influence. How much of an impact did you have over the successful development of a product? Now, Jake was helped by 709 people. 709 people helped him make his product a reality. Now, if you open up the instruction manual for the Pivot Power, there are each of the names of all 709 people that helped make Jake's product real. And their corresponding sort of influence or impact percentage. Every time one unit of the Pivot Power sells, every single one of those 709 people get paid in real time. That's Jake, and that's one story. But Quirky is about rinse and repeat. We actually have two Jakes roll through the Quirky world every single week. We launch a consumer product every Tuesday at 12 and every Thursday at 12, regardless of what's going on in the world. Two consumer products, consumer products being an industry that used to take tens of millions of dollars and multiple years just to push one product out into the world. By harnessing technology and community, and real-time decision-making um, you know, uh, processes, we're able to actually launch two consumer products every single week. Sort of what our pipeline looks like. So that's a chihuahua. Um, no, no, but that's Quirky's story. Um, and it's a fun story, and it's a story I love telling. I love meeting inventors, and I love sort of realizing that we're making their lives a lot easier by helping them sort of bring closure to their idea. Just think, 1,500 people a week submit their product ideas to Quirky. Now, we only push two or, th two or three forward. Um, but those 1,497 people or whatever that didn't win, they at least have closure. 
right? Their ideas aren't just bouncing around their head thinking, well, what if? So um, when we talk about websites and when you talk to un other fellow entrepreneurs and everyone's telling you about their new mobile app or they're telling you about uh, their new analytics software, think about how we can use technology and applications and all that to not just sort of make it easier to talk to your friends or share photos, but to actually create physical objects that can make our lives easier, that can push the world forward. Um, that's my shtick. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs>